Welcome, everyone. My name is Ian Bruce. I'm the executive coordinator with Peninsula Stream Society. Um, otherwise, probably be called the executive director. Uh, this is the third presentation that staff has made to members. And uh, the reason we've been doing it, it was because at the regular uh, staff or board meetings, the the staff presentations went on for so long and people wanted to ask questions and we just decided that it would be better to do it uh, this way. I look like I'm freezing up, Katrina, am I? No. No, I think you're okay. All right, okay. So thank you for attending and being a member. Most of you here are members. Um, we've invited other guests, uh, particularly uh, mayors and councils um, from the municipalities that we operate in and some of them we don't operate in. So welcome. Uh, we're gonna talk today about um, uh, what we're doing, what the staff's been up to over the summer. And uh, we did plan to hold these about quarterly, um, but we haven't had one since June. So this is a big catch up over a very busy period. Mm -hmm. And so this is to let you know what we do. This is not everything that we've done. This is the staff, these are the highlights of the major activities and projects we've done. Uh, honorable mention to some of the groups that we won't be talking about tonight, and that's Todd Creek King, for sure. Um, uh, Ray Creek at um, Sydney, um, uh, Blue Heron Creek. I had, uh, had some projects going out there this year, but um, so we're gonna keep it um, uh, fairly tight to the major projects. And uh, we want your feedback and ideas on on the existing projects we have and directions we we want to go in and you can either put that in the chat or ask questions as we go along there'll be a q a uh, period at the end uh, this is another reminder to renew your memberships we're about 100 memberships behind where we were last year so if you haven't renewed your uh, membership please do so now it's good till the end of calendar 2023 it's only ten dollars i would suggest that I'm what I'm going to be doing this year is giving my immediate family memberships um, uh, for, for for part of their Christmas present. So that's a it's a good idea. It'll pull them in a little closer. Um, so this session will be recorded and it'll be shared with our board members and with um, other people as we as we see fit. So uh, I'd like to, on behalf of the society, acknowledge that we operate on the traditional ancestral territories of the Lagwangan and Wasanich people. We acknowledge the ancestors, hereditary leaders, and matriarchs, as well as the stewards of these lands. We give thanks for the privilege of working and living here. And I'd like to also thank our donors, um, our donors who have do donated cash and in-kind um, uh, goods and services. Thank you very much. Um, over this, especially the last few years, we've been able to um, expand our staff, expand our activities, and do more good things on the ground. And this includes the municipality. So thank you for your support. Um, and uh, we look forward to working with you into the future. So a little bit of format and housekeeping. Uh, we've got, uh, it's a, kind of an informal style, opposed to sort of a webinar. Uh, please keep your microphone muted. Um, and we'll mute it if you forget. Um, each staff member will present. Uh, we might have time for some quick questions after each presentation. Um, if not, hold to the end. Um, I'll jump in, uh, Katrina, and I'll be the timekeeper on this. And you can either type your questions into the chat or uh, wait till the presenter is finished and unmute your, unmute your mic. We'll end this session with a longer uh, Q&A period um, at the end. And uh, yes, yeah, so that's it. Um, so I would like to uh, just put out that uh, we have, this is a late edition. I suggested to Katrina, and by the way, thank you Katrina for putting this together. Katrina Adams is our freshwater specialist and biologist. And um, she was took a leader leadership role on getting this uh, going uh, this time. And so uh, I, I thought a map showing where we operate and where some of these places that we've, uh, we're have we gonna be discussing and talking about, um, if we had a map, we can refer back to it 
And just to give you out, everybody out there a uh, um, better idea of where these, where some of these places are. Um, so I'd like to, as I've introduced Katrina uh, Adams, also like to introduce um, uh, Austin Matthews, or sorry, Austin Nolan, um, uh, who's our, our, our most recent hire. He is a support biologist. And he's working right now. His major activities is on the forage fish um, uh, beach survey monitoring, as well as helping out on on other projects. Um, and then we have Kyle um, uh, Armstrong, who's a restoration coordinator. He's been tearing up the, um, the turf, so to speak, putting in tearing up the parking lots and putting in uh, rain gardens all over the place, as well as doing some great work on the beach and the estuaries. You can hear all about that. And uh, also a new, uh, a, a new uh, hire we have is Sue Gillette, who replaced Francesca uh, in this administration and stewardship coordinator's position. And she's, she's here tonight. So Sue is the, when you send an email to Peninsula Streams, contact Peninsula Streams, she is the contact um, contact. So at this point in time, I think I'm going to turn it over to Austin. I just want to say also to, to our board members that are here, welcome. Thank you for your support. Sean, the executive, all of you, uh, we couldn't do it without you. Thanks very much and take it away, Austin. All right, thanks Ian. Uh, hi everybody, as Ian said, I'm, I'm relatively new. I'm the new support biologist with Peninsula Streams. Um, so if you haven't met me before, hi. Uh, a little about me, just cause I'm new. I was born and raised here on Vancouver Island up in Nanaimo. Uh, I finished my bachelor of science degree with a major in biology and a minor in environmental studies at UVic back in early 2020. Um, I started with Peninsula Streams back in May of this year. However, I did do some work with them prior to this. Um, as Ian said, I've recently inherited the Forge Fish program among some other hats. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the beach program and Forge Fish, as well as the uh, repair we did on the Atkins uh, fish ladder this summer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so starting with the beach program, uh, beach program stands for beach education and conservation of habitat. Uh, and within this umbrella, we do beach cleans, forage fish egg surveys, restoration, advocacy, uh, and conservation out on the local beaches. Uh, we have dedicated citizen scientists who have accumulated 1,115 volunteer hours for the beach program this year. That's probably some of you, so thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the goals of the beach program include empowering citizen scientists, cleaning up local beaches and waterways, restoring local beaches, and protecting our beaches from threats of pollution uh, and habitat loss, which habitat loss happens because of erosion, development, uh, rising sea levels because of climate change. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of our goal. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if you haven't heard of forage fish before, uh, there's a couple pictures here. Uh, they're simply just small schooling fish that form the base of the food chain. Uh, they eat small creatures such as plankton, and they're really important for feeding larger animals like salmon, seals, seabirds, uh, lots. Uh, sand lance in general are actually uh, eaten by Chinook salmon, uh, which are of course important for orca whales, so it's all connected. Um, examples of forage fish include herring, anchovies, sardines, Pacific land, sand lance, surf smelt. Uh, because they are critical to the health of the marine and coastal food chains, determining their spawning habitats is also critical. So our surveys target surf smelt and sand lance spawning habitat. And that spawning habitat is found in the intertidal zone on sand pebble beaches, sand gravelly beaches, where you can kind of for a pea gravel size. Um, yeah, so the picture on the left shows a, a surf smelt and a sand lance. On the right, that's a sand lance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's a couple older pictures from previous years of eggs we have found. Uh, I think it's quite interesting to look at, especially you can see the different stages. Um, you have the uh, sand lance emerging in the top right there. Um, and yeah, we these are all look like uh, eggs that we have found. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so how do our citizen scientists find these eggs on the beaches? Well, if you are a forage fish volunteer, you are probably already very, very familiar with these green sieves and the big blue bowl vortex bowl there. Uh, but for those of you that are not, uh, we find the eggs that the forage fish have laid in the intertidal zone by collecting bulk samples, which means we take uh, lots of scoops of sediment along a 30 meter transect that's split into four quadrats. We then filter this material through three sieves, 
from largest to smallest, uh, with the smallest being about half a millimeter in size. The eggs are about three quarters of a millimeter, so they're caught alongside the finer beach material. Then that, that already filtered sample is then vortexed through that blue bowl system you can see on the right. Um, there's a pump, so the battery is hooked up to a pump and that toad is full of water. And it's vortexed through, which picks up the eggs and the really fine beach material, which then flows through the center. We catch in a sieve. Uh, we collect it into a jar, and then it's examined by our volunteers under a microscope. Um, within Forage Fish, we have accumulated about 883 volunteer hours in 2022 so far. So thank you very much, those of you that are involved. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a little map I threw together. This is this is where we have found forged fish uh, within the last year from November 2021 to November 2022. Um, surf smelt are represented by blue dots and sand lance are represented by red dots. I did a bit of a zoom in on North Saanich and Sydney as the majority of our finds have been from there. Uh, farther south, we have found eggs at Haynes Park, which is an Oak Bay, Esquimalt Lagoon, Royal Beach, uh, and at the Victoria International Marina on the Song He's Walkway Pocket Beach that Kyle did some restoration work on, which I think he'll probably tell you a little bit about later. Um, there wasn't suitable sediment there uh, prior to restoration, so when we found eggs there, it was great. Uh, build it and they will come. Uh, you might have seen us in the media uh, in regards to this a couple of weeks ago or a month ago. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the beaches that we've had pa positive detections on within the last year. Uh, Tryon Beach is a big one, uh, North Saanich Yacht Club, Esquimalt Lagoon, Royal Beach, uh, Talista, Coles Bay, lot, lots and lots of different beaches. Um, Tryon Beach seems to be one of our most prolific beaches. We seem to find eggs there very often. Um, so I've added two pictures there of Tryon Beach. Um, you can kind of s these pictures, I think, show well the um, kind of the substrate that we're looking for. It's that sand base with a mix of pebble and pea gravel on top. There's a little bit of bigger stuff, but it's majority of it's pebble and pea gravel, um, which are exactly what the forage fish are looking for to spawn in. Um, also, I think a beach worth mentioning is Royal Beach Site 4, uh, where we have found both species at. Uh, next slide, please. Um, besides uh, sampling for eggs in the water, we also do eDNA. Um, this is currently happening. It's run by one of our volunteers at Portage Inlet Linear Park and at the Songhees Pocket Beach. Um, environmental DNA is very useful for determining species in the area, especially cryptic and small species that would be hard to find otherwise. Um, this could also give us insight into forage fish in the area. Um, data from this monitoring is pending. We're waiting to hear back from Hakai, um, but we're very excited to see what we find. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, beaches in needs of cleans. Um, Brian hosted a beach event uh, with about 23 volunteers back on July 2nd this summer. Um, but we're always on the lookout for beaches in need of a clean. So if you notice lots of garbage on some of our local beaches, uh, send me pics and a location. Uh, I'll have my email there. I'll put it in the chat as well, and I'm sure we'll follow up with you guys. And um, But, you know, let us know. Uh, we're always looking for uh, beaches to clean. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm also going to briefly talk about the uh, fishway repair that we did this summer. Um, it underwent some damage during the floods of 2021, and, and the main problem was the dislodgement of about six boulders on the downstream side of that culvert, um, just that you can see there on the, in, the, in the picture on the right. Uh, these boulders were acting as bank armoring, and they also dissipated the flow energy by creating a little bit of turbulence, um, so losing them wasn't great. Uh, also, the riffle downstream of the fishway uh, had accumulated material and wasn't functioning quite properly. Uh, the step pools of the fishway were leaking. Uh, this isn't really an issue during high flows when salmon are spawning, but during low flows, it could affect uh, trout's ability to migrate up and below the fishway. Um, so we wanted to get that fixed as well. Uh, there was also a little bit of scouring on the left bank floodplain uh, immediately downstream of the fishway. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's uh, a couple pictures of the site. Uh, the one on the right I took, I'm standing on top of the culvert, um, so you can kind of see down onto the site. Um, those logs with the matting on top are over top of a very large pool, which we would drain every morning. Um, this was following Katrina and I defished the whole area before the project started and uh, we kept it isolated. Uh, the machine then drives onto those logs with the matting on top to protect the logs um, in order to be able to reach the banks to do some bank armoring. Um, I also added this picture of there was these owls on site that were not scared of the machines at all. We're swooping down. Um, 
we did isolate fish, but uh, some of them can get around. So every morning when we dewatered, we had to keep an eye out for little fish and make sure we beat the owls to them. Uh, so th that's why I added that picture there. I thought it, they were quite uh, interesting. And yeah, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the main the main goal of our of our uh, repair here was um, restabilizing that bank armoring that was dislodged during the flood. So that included adding more boulders, and we would drill holes through these boulders and down into the bedrock below them. Then you run a steel rod down through the boulder and into the bedrock, and and that obviously holds that boulder in place. And then we would we supported all of these new boulders and all this bank armoring uh, with shotcrete, which is kind of that whiter material you can see in the picture there uh, towards the bottom. The shotcrete was then cut to be a little bit more rock shaped and look a little more naturalized. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the other problems, of course, was the riffle crest uh, downstream and the floodplain scouring. Um, so some of the excess material was redistributed, uh, the riffle crest was reconstructed, um, and the more channel morphology was altered slightly to better protect the banks. Uh, we also added some gravel. Um, you can kind of see in the picture there on the on the left bank there that that bank armoring that's been added to help prevent uh, that scour. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there's a little video if it'll play. And this is just the excavator placing some of the rocks for that riffle. It just fits so perfectly. <laughs> he was quite a good uh, operator we had on this project, so it was nice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, yeah, the step pools were leaking. Um, the picture on the left shows the step pools prior to being resealed. Um, I had pumped water through the pools. This was in the summertime, so there wasn't much flow. So I pumped a water lot through the pools to mark the leaks. Um, and you can see that the water is uh, building up a little bit in each pool, but it's essentially leaking around. Uh, what's supposed to happen properly, which you can see in the picture on the right, is uh, the water supposed to build up and then spill over the concrete weir and into the next and into the next and into the next. That allows the fish to jump up between. Um, the picture on the right was taken just this fall. We had sealed up the leaks with um, shotcrete, and it seems to have worked. Um, and things are flowing properly, and it looks a lot better. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, it was a little bit brief for me. Uh, I'm relatively new, um, but if you see any beaches in need of a clean or you're interested in taking part in forage fisheries and you haven't, please send me an email. Um, Again, I'll, I'll put it in the chat and, and I'm sure you can be in contact with me later, but uh, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I can uh, pass it off to Katrina. We have a, maybe a couple minutes for questions. If anyone has any questions for Austin, if not, um, we can... Uh, 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 you guys can ask some questions right at the end as well, but uh, any questions? Otherwise, I'll move on to my talk. <laughs> okay, great. <clears throat> All right. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Katrina Adams. Uh, I'm an aquatic biologist, uh, water quality coordinator for Peninsula Streams. I've been working with Peninsula Streams for about um, just over a year and a half now. And um, yeah, I just want to chat today and give you some updates on some of the projects that I've been working on, particularly through the, the summer and fall, as well as give some uh, brief overview of some of the projects that are upcoming as well for the next year. So uh, first thing, uh, some these are some of the grants that I've been involved with, with uh, along with Kyle. Um, I applied for a big grant with uh, the Environment Canada Eco Action, uh, which was successful, which was really great news. This uh, involves activities with stewardship within the Qantas, um, SACOM 1010 and Millstream watershed, as well as restoration within the Qantas or Hagen Graham and Millstream watershed, including the, the Woodwind Farm property, uh, as well as some stormwater management activities, including rain gardens, and then looking at the Keating Industrial Area. I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Other uh, projects include looking at coho monitoring within Colquitt's Craig Farm Millstream with PSF. And then Kyle and I just put in these two big grants with BC Shrift and ARF, which is a federal uh, program. 
Uh, these will allow us to have um, some really long-term uh, steady funding and allow us to create some um, big programs within uh, Colquitt's Craig Flower Millstream Mill watersheds, as well as the Portage Inlet and Victoria Harbor as well. Some of the activities will include monitoring, so water quality and quantity, which is one that we'd like to expand on, um, as well as uh, in-stream habitat for fish, as well as fish distribution population assessments, restoration, both um, in-stream as well as estuary and shoreline uh, restoration, and then some research projects were also included in the BC SHRIP application. So um, yeah, really exciting. Uh, hopefully we're successful, but uh, definitely more to come on that. So for some of the projects that I have completed over the last few months, I'll sort of break them down by watershed. The first one being the Qantas watershed or Hag and Graham. From the last um, presentation, I had updated that I had completed the full habitat assessment of both Hagen and Graham Creek. And I wanted to pair that with a distribution study of coastal cutthroat trout, so CCT, uh, within both Hagen and Graham. And I'll talk about that in just a sec here. Other activities within Qantas include continuing engagement with Sartlip First Nation. We're working on strengthening our partnership with the nation and some uh, working on possible restoration projects as well. And then finally, working on revitalizing the Qantas Community Stewardship Group. I've talked about this before, um, but uh, yeah, early January, we will be sending out emails to start organizing some community meetings. Um, so if anyone is interested in this, please send me an email and uh, we'll make sure to get you involved and um, onto the email chain to get this group started and uh, get working uh, into the watershed. So for cutthroat trout, um, really fun field work, sort of wading through streams and doing electrofishing. Austin and Tamara, one of our summer students, uh, we walked uh, several locations, about 10 or so, uh, spread throughout Hague and Graham and looking for cutthroat trout. Um, and this system is really interesting in that there is a large uh, waterfall right at the mouth of Hagen Creek, which prevents trout from returning to the stream. And so uh, it's thought that this is, uh, creates a very uh, isolated and gene sort of genetic, genetically isolated population of cutthroat trout and BC fishery biologists are particularly interested in this. So, we were taking small fin clips, which were then sent to these biologists for uh, analysis. And um, yeah, we just are looking at how the genetics uh, vary within each site and particularly above and below barriers. So I'll show you a map here. You don't have to look, read all the, the details on here, but basically the green are the sites where we found cutthroat, red are where we sampled but did not find cutthroat. Uh, this particular site here, um, right above New Mount, New Mount Newton Crossroad, is a large sort of concrete man-made waterfall type barrier that prevents trout from going upstream. So we're particularly interested in to see how different the genetics are of the trout above and below um, this particularly barrier, particular barrier here, as well as the whole system compared to other systems such as Millstream where we also took samples. So some other interesting observations, this fish here on the right, beautiful individual, it was over 33 centimeters long, uh, didn't quite fit in this fish window here, but yeah, yeah, really, uh, really great individual that we caught right here. So right in this essentially almost looks like a ditch in an agricultural field. You look at this, this pool that we found it, didn't look like great habitat, but we found this big fish as well as several other big ones around 30 centimeters or so. Um, so yeah, there's definitely opportunity for restoration and yeah, just really great to see some, some big specimens in there as well. So for Millstream, we had lots of activities. Austin already chatted about the big Atkins Road uh, repair, um, but other activities included completing the uh, habitat assessment. So similar to Qantas, we walked the entire Millstream um, and um, mapped out habitat, fish habitat as well as riparian, um, and then paired that as well with uh, cutthroat trout distribution uh, throughout the stream. This stream was a little more trickier for identification as there's also coho, rainbow, trout, and then we also saw some that looked like a good, uh, could be a hybrid between cutthroat and rainbow. So 
definitely made it a little tricky to make sure that we collected only cutthroat trout. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, lots of lots of different fish within the system and spread wide uh, throughout the, the, the stream as well. Just quick uh, overview. This is just some of the sites that we found uh, cutthroat. So the map on the left here is the lower section. So around the fish ladders, we found all species at all these sites where there's green um, and including coho just above, it's like coho fry, I should say, just above the, the fish ladder. Um, and then the, the map on the right here is on the Mary Lake Sanctuary grounds. Um, we found lots of cutthroat in this stream as it's really great habitat, it's beautiful there. Um, but yeah, no, no coho found up that far. Uh, and just, yeah, just a quick update on coho. Um, we, uh, the, <clears throat> sorry, the, the chart on the left uh, is from the fish camera uh, located at um, uh, ladder one. Uh, this, these are counted, the coho going through the camera are counted um, by uh, volunteers from Goldstream Hatchery. And uh, to date, there's been about 167 coho. I think there could be probably be a bit more now. This might be slightly outdated uh, with um, 75 males, 71 females, and then about 20 uh, jacks as well. And um, yeah, the photo uh, here with on the top, uh, me holding a, a coho, this was caught well above ladder four. So I'll just go back to the map here, oops, sorry. Um, so yeah, this fish had gone up ladder one, two, three, and then just above four as well. So really, and that was pretty early on in the spawning season as well. So it was, yeah, when Austin and I were out there, electrofishing was really exciting uh, to see some fish coming up through, including this one, this little video here I took of it jumping through ladder two. It was really exciting to see them jump and then particularly using the, uh, the infrastructure as well that we have put into the stream. And as I mentioned, fry we found well above um, ladder six. So um, we're definitely going to be doing some more sampling over next summer as well to sort of really see how far uh, the coho fry are found. So other activities within Millstream um, include stewardship. So early uh, June, July, we organized several community meetings in Millstream as well as walkabouts in the parks. Um, and we had an amazing group of volunteers uh, and community members come out um, interested and the end of this was that um, a new search trip group was formed called the Friends of Millstream Watershed. They're made up of an amazing dedicated group of volunteers and they've already had several work parties removing invasive species, several meetings and plans for the future and um, we'll be doing some stream keepers training with them, getting them going on water quality monitoring as well as some other um, activities as well. Photo on the right shows Steve, Steve Adamanchak, one of our very dedicated volunteers. He's with um, the Goldstream Hatchery. Do amazing work uh, throughout Millstream. And uh, yeah, here we are supporting, you can see Austin there right in the middle of the ladder. Uh, they're helping to clear out the ladders, getting them ready for the, the salmon spawning season. Uh, moving on, so this is Colquitt's watershed. We had a big restoration project there just in Copley Park. Uh, worked with uh, Saanich Parks and Creeks and Waterways, as well as Dave Clough. We restored a um, 100 meter section, um, just continuing on from work that had been done in 2019 and 2020. And we put in approximately two, well, we put in two boulder runs, uh, three ripples with spawning beds, two really nice pools. Uh, with lots of large woody debris, you can see here, which creates great, great hidey holes um, and habitat for fish. Um, and uh, yeah, just I'll show you a couple of pictures here of what the reach looked like before restoration. So this section had zero rock, uh, not a lot of in-stream cover for fish. There was a few stick jams, but mostly garbage. And um, yeah, lots of erosion and undermining of large mature trees. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity for restoration and a couple after photos. The photo on the left here is a really nice boulder run, um, which creates a lot of great habitat for invertebrates or fish food. The water flows really beautifully along there now. Uh, the middle photo is that really big pool where we put in all that big wood that you saw in the other photo. 
um, including this little island here, a great little habitat island. But this deep pool creates great refuge during uh, summer low flows. Um, and particularly when we get longer and longer droughts, uh, this would be a really important habitat for, for fish to hide in um, during those really low flows. And then this is just a really great spawning bed, which turned out to be very useful for fish as um, we have had fish spawning, uh, coho spawning in this new restored section. So I went back almost every week um, during the spawning season to try and spot some salmon. Fortunately, I myself didn't see the fish themselves, but I did find several reds or nests. Uh, you could see this really light, lighter colored gravel, sort of surrounded by darker algae covered gravel. This is where fish have used their tails to dig in the gravel to lay their eggs. Um, so yeah, I was really excited to see this red and that fish had been using it. And we had some community members come up to me when I was out there saying that they had themselves seen some coho um, spawning and swimming around in the big deep pool that we had built. Um, so yeah, really, really exciting to see that. And then uh, walking up upstream, I had also seen reds uh, quite a ways up actually on Colquitt's. Uh, this is just off Lindsay Street. Um, and then we had uh, someone mention that they had seen Simon spawning in Mahone Brook, which is a very small tributary, like fairly high up in Colquitt's. Um, not a great habitat, but pretty amazing to see that salmon were spawning in there. But uh, yeah, it's approximately two day, probably still a little outdated as well. Oh yeah, from November 25th. From the fish fence, the camera there, there's been approximately 470 coho counted. This number is a little bit off um, due to some issues of fish swimming back and forth, but still really amazing result to see these numbers of uh, fish coming into this very urbanized uh, watershed. Um, still within the Colquitt's watershed, we've also done some work with Swan Creek. Uh, so in September, we organized several uh, community uh, restoration sites or um, restoration work parties, sorry, uh, where we had the Friends of Swan Creek um, and some other community members come out and help build a riffle as well as enhancing four other riffles along just off of Columbine Way. Really amazing day, um, beautiful, beautiful evenings and uh, really strong members, especially John Coates here. I'm gonna give a shout out to him. He's one of our most dedicated volunteers. Uh, moving this giant pile of rock and gravel. Everyone, everyone worked really hard and uh, built these great new habitat within Swan Creek, which was also successful with uh, attracting coho to spawn. So a couple photos from John who goes out there a lot to do water quality monitoring. This one here with the heron shows that's where we had put in that new riffle and he had seen some coho there with the heron, of course, looking for them as well. Um, and then some other sites along Swan Creek where uh, coho were spotted spawning. So really successful uh, restoration projects and definitely more to come next, next year as well. And lastly, uh, water quality still continuing on, monthly sampling within several watersheds. The issue that I've been working on was uh, doing data management and sorting out where to store the data in an accessible way. And uh, we've managed to partner with Water Rangers, which is a great organization that has an easy to use accessible um, database, really nice visualization of data on there. So I'm just linking up different stewardship groups of getting their data uploaded there. And um, as I mentioned, we'll be doing some stream keepers training. Um, and then looking at revitalizing or restarting the Keating Industrial Area uh, stormwater management. So we'll be going in there and uh, chatting with uh, business owners on um, proper stormwater management practices. And that is it for me. Anyone has any questions um, or we can wait to the end as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, we, we have questions right now. Is everyone just um, uh, kind of stunned with the, um, with the, we have had questions in the chat while you were talking. Some good ones from John Rogers, thank you. And some good answers from Dora. So <clears throat> there's some uh, 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 contact information for the Millstream group, as well as the next uh, Millstream cleanup. It's at Cedarvale Park on December the 18th at 1 p.m. So that's great. Thank you, uh, Katrina. And I suppose we move on to Kyle. Take it away, Kyle. Right on. Thanks, Ian. 
Uh, my name is Kyle Armstrong. I'm the restorator, restoration coordinator for Peninsula Stream Society. Um, yeah, happy to share a little bit of an update about what we've been working on. Um, <clears throat> starting with uh, some of our shoreline restoration projects, moving into our rain gardens, and uh, following up with just uh, what's been happening in Belker Creek. Next slide, please. Um, we were able to complete the Portage Inlet Linear Park Beach Enhancement Project. Um, this is located at the head of uh, Portage Inlet, way up Victoria Harbor waterways. Um, next slide, please. And essentially what we were trying to achieve was uh, basically enhancing some of the beach substrate for some of those spawning species of forage fish, in particular uh, surf smelt, as well as improve um, the uh, public use of the site as it is a, a park. Uh, next slide, please. So we brought in, uh, using plans from Coastal Geological Services, brought in a, a lot of nourishment material for the beach, um, size specifically and source specifically uh, to be suitable for forage fish spawning. Uh, we brought in a bunch of that material, graded it, um, built a couple of features, to, uh, rock features to help try to keep some of that material on site as long as possible. Um, and then we brought volunteers in to do a little bit of backshore planting. Um, there's John Rogers in the photo there. Uh, this was a partnership with Be Royal, um, and we really appreciated their support on this project. Uh, and on the right there are some of the volunteers from uh, local residents, as well as it uh, looks like Yogi from Rural Fisheries Trust and Jacques Roy from uh, the Friends of Migratory Birds. And uh, yeah, and it was just a really great uh, project that we were happy to finally complete um, after getting a little bit stalled up with, uh, with some issues around COVID. Next slide, please. Uh, just down the way uh, in Portage Inlet is the mouth of Hospital Creek. And I've presented on this in the past on how we kind of went to the site, noticed that it was um, like many of our marsh areas in, the, in this area, uh, being really heavily disturbed by uh, hyperabundant Canada geese, uh, which graze on the, on the marsh communities as well as kind of grub during <clears throat> flightless periods for them uh, and have a huge kind of impact and cause erosion. Um, so what we ended up doing uh, was building a kind of an experimental exclosure using uh, deer fencing and, and pencil posts. And we brought volunteers in. Some of you may have joined us on that event. It was really fun. And uh, we saw lots of early success with vegetation, as you can see in the two photos, comparisons uh, coming back in a, in a really big way. Uh, next slide, please. This time around, we, we brought in the big guns. We brought in uh, the guardians of mid-island estuaries uh, from, from further up the island who have a lot of experience uh, in, in kind of protecting and restoring marsh systems, in particular from the, the impacts of Canada geese. Um, and they introduced us to something called ecocultural fencing. So rather than using that deer fencing um, and pencil posts, uh, they use kind of a more natural approach uh, using alder posts and willow weaves throughout it. So same idea, creating an exclosure that geese will not want to land in there. Um, and we basically expanded the exclosure all the way up Hospital Creek. So a huge area, um, which we will plant with Lingby sedge uh, in the springtime. And Lingby sedge is a really um, important kind of uh, engineering species uh, for these marsh meadows and, and in many of our marsh systems it's completely eradicated we believe because uh, of geese grazing so um, we're really pioneering uh, techniques down in Victoria here in the capital region right along parallel with the capital regional district as they develop their goose management strategy so it's really great having that added support from from the uh, gardens of mid-island estuaries coming down and we're very excited to plant some of these areas with lingby sedge and 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 see the impact next slide please there's some of our volunteers there. It was great to involve the local community as well as uh, some of our board members. There's Sean Evans standing uh, in his in his boots there, uh, getting his hands dirty and mucky. Uh, there's uh, Tim Claremont uh, as well as Jacqueline Bars from the World Wildlife Federation. So lots of people coming together um, and helping us with these initiatives. And and you know there's a lot of momentum here. Um, and yeah, <clears throat> and again lots of support from View Royal. Uh, for this project um, and and letting us kind of work in these waterways and 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 do these kind of uh, progressive treatments on on some of these uh, areas. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, moving down a little further out via Victoria Harbour Waterway to about the Middle Harbour, uh, we were able to complete phase one of the Songhees Walkway Pocket Beach Restoration Project. Um, this is kind of a multi-partnership, uh, part of the Resilient Coast for Salmon uh, initiative by Pacific Salmon Foundation, the BC Stewardship Centre. Um, we identified a small pocket beach, which would be a perfect kind of uh, showcasing of how we can use um, some of these treatments um, to create resilience and better habitat for, for fish uh, along our shorelines, while also taking the opportunity to improve kind of some of the cultural values and bring awareness to kind of some of the heritage of these sites. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, so this pocket beach is just a small, small portion of, of what was once a much larger complex of what was Lime Bay and Mud Bay. So if you've ever been to Spinnakers and looked out at that bay out front, that's Lime Bay. Um, the image on the right is a map that shows what the historic shoreline used to be. Um, so Lime Bay, you know, extended much further back up into the rail yards, um, kind of came out around a peninsula where our beach is, is currently located, and then it tucked into what was known as Mud Bay. Um, and this was a really important site uh, for the Songhees and Esquimalt uh, nations and Lokpungan people, uh, as well as visiting nations, and has a, a really long history and rich cultural history of, of different usage and um, from different peoples on the coast here throughout history. So uh, essentially what we wanted to do was try to bring some of those values back. Next slide, please. So on the right is a historic photo of, of what Mud Bay once looked like. It was really low grade uh, with railing back shores, nice sandy kind of gravel beach, similar to what Austin showed, probably uh, looked a lot like Tryon Beach in terms of material on it. Um, a great place to land canoes, um, you know, gentle kind of energy. Uh, and then on to the left, and what kind of remains is this kind of relic small pocket beach, lots of debris, um, basically used as a dump site, uh, cement, asphalt on the beach, not a lot of, uh, if any, material for forage fish to use, lots of angular rock that eroded from that armoring material that was used to protect the shoreline, um, and, and so just not a really great piece of habitat. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, with lots of planning and permitting and, and gathering all the partners uh, together, we were able to kind of finally break ground and we were able to remove a lot of that material. On the left, you see some of the cement being pulled out in asphalt. I think we, we probably recovered about 10 tons, uh, loading it up in the truck and, and getting rid of that. Um, we also brought in about 500 tons of, of uh, gravel and sand material um and built a, a small sill so a lot of the the boulders and things that were strewn across the beach we were able to move kind of further down the beach and create uh, a nice sill which i think will be used um hopefully by by red abalone and a red listed species it would it'd make a very good habitat for that um while also kind of creating these beach-like conditions for uh forage fish which are of really high sh they're quite rare it's becoming very rare in victoria harbor to have these kind of small gravel pocket beaches and low-grade uh, uh shorelines where erosion is allowed to take place next slide please um so we have a little before and after photos as i said a lot of those boulders are kind of moved down subtitly um a lot of that's concrete and was removed and asphalt um and that's kind of what we're left with there is this kind of remix of the forage fish friendly material that we brought in from offsite. Um, and that was phase one. And phase two, what we hope to do is uh, dig a little bit further into the back shore where we can put a little bit more of the finer materials, the smaller sands and gravels, um, and create a little bit more habitat suitability for them, as well as uh, make a beach that's able to be landed on by Songhees and their cultural tours. Um, as a partner, that was something they expressed as, as being an important. So we're trying to facilitate that. Um, and we'll do some native plant and backshore plantings, and all of this will uh, eventually be certified uh, through the, the Green Shores program as a Green Shores certification site with the City of Victoria, um, the Songhees Nation, the Esquimalt Nation, uh, Pacific Salmon Foundation, the BC Stewardship Center. So a really great partnership um, and really just showcasing uh, what, what can be done uh, to improve ecological and cultural values while creating a little bit of resilience to uh, sea level rise and, and climate change. There's a, uh, a conference coming up, the Coastal Zone Conference, which will um, bring kind of a lot of coastal engineers and practitioners from around the world uh, to Victoria. And it's very exciting because we're hoping that phase two will be wrapped up 
um, and the site will be able to be on the showcase uh, for these practitioners to come and visit and try their feedback. So really great little project and we're looking forward to wrapping it up uh, early in the spring. Next slide, please. Uh, and yeah, as Austin mentioned, you know, we, we invited our, uh, the Marine groups from the Songhees Nation and Squamalt Nation uh, down and showcased some of these monitoring techniques. We really weren't expecting to find anything. It was more just looking at the method uh, as they have interest in, in sampling their territories moving forward. Um, so we were showcasing that and lo and behold, uh, we gave it to our <laughs> sample to our dedicated microscopists and, um, and they detected a positive pit. We had uh, surf smelt eggs, you know, I think within three weeks of, of putting the material down, uh, fish were using it. So a really good positive news story that the, the habitat is being utilized because, you know, we really weren't sure if that was going to be the case. So um, yeah, really exciting. Everyone's very excited about that. Uh, I think Austin probably the most so. And, uh, and yeah, next slide, please. Um, moving on a little bit up the peninsula, all the way to Roberts Bay in, in Sydney <clears throat> um, and the Mermaid Creek Marsh system. So this is a system, uh, if you're not familiar, that's been eroding really rapidly over the past uh, 80 years or more um, with a very kind of negative decline of, of that foreshore marsh just, just eroding rapidly. Um, as well as upstream of Mermaid Creek, which is kind of like a slough, um, there's been a lot of uh, erosion within that upper mark. So Peninsula Streams uh, with the Roberts Bay residents um, and their champions uh, have, have partnered as well as with Sea Change, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, Sacum Marine and the Sacum First Nation um, to try to do something about it. And, uh, and yeah, so this past summer we were able to focus kind of on the upstream side of things in, in Mermaid Creek. Next slide, please. Um, and again, using that eco-cultural fencing technique. Um, you know, whether geese are the primary reason why there's such heavy erosion is, is to be determined. But um, what we plan to do is, is bring Lingby sedge in as kind of that engineer in hopes that it can capture some of that eroding sediment and stabilize it and begin uh, kind of creating more marsh in this area um, and, and, and dampening some of the, the impacts of development um, that have occurred at this site. Um, there's some volunteers on the left collecting the, the willow uh, the material that's required to weave in between those alder posts that you see on the right. Um, and yeah, again, just a, a natural approach that, you know, is going to create habitat as well as protect our plantings when we go back there in the spring with Lingby sedge and, and plant it up. Uh, next slide, please. There's a shot of the crew there on the right. We've got the Gardens Midon Estuaries, Peninsula Stream staff, and then uh, Thierry, uh, the local resident champion of Roberts Bay residents with his, with his son, um, who also came and helped out and, and provided encouragement. Um, and that's kind of what the fencing looks like on the left once it's all weaved in. And so what we're really hoping is that uh, as we plant uh, the, the sedge, it'll kind of help build those eroded areas in between the fencing and the marsh there. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, and I should just mention, uh, and we have some very exciting things and treatments. We've, we've consulted with uh, DHI um, to create some plans, as well as with the Sacum Marine and Sacum First Nation on doing some restoration of the marsh area uh, at Mermaid Creek and, and trying to improve that delta uh, size and sustainability. Uh, so yeah, uh, moving on back down the peninsula uh, to Oak Bay uh, at the Monteith Reach of Bowker Creek. We're into our second year of preparing for chum uh, egg incubation as part of the chum reintroduction project. Uh, so there's some Friends of Bowker Creek volunteers and Peninsula Streams volunteers uh, coming together to kind of do some repairs to the shoal. Uh, I call it shoal 2.0 uh, with a little bit of what we've learned and, and, and applying it to this time around. Um, last year was very su successful with uh, eggs successfully incubating. However, we can always make improvements and, um, and hopefully we don't have the same kind of level of flooding that we had last time around. But um, yeah, so we've, we've rebuilt, the, rebuilt the shoal and uh, all news from the hatchery uh, point that we will be getting some chum eggs uh, to, to do another round. So um, this is an ongoing effort and uh, we're very excited to be participating and partnering with uh, the town of Oak Bay, the Goldstream Hatchery, DFO, and the Friends of Bowker Creek um, in, this, uh, in this momentous kind of uh, effort. 
Uh, and the Friends of Bunker Creek continue to do excellent uh, work doing riparian plantings upstream, uh, as well as other things, um, water quality monitoring, and next slide please, uh, rain gardens. So uh, the rain garden for headwater program with Peninsula Streams, we had a very successful webinar with really great attendance and feedback on that with some wonderful professionals, including Deborah Jones from Kruger Creek Stream Keepers, Kristen from uh, Satin Flower Nurseries, Brianne from the city of Victoria, and uh, Scott Murdoch. And if, if you didn't get a chance to tune in, it's on our YouTube channel, and it's a really great resource for anyone looking to, uh, to build a rain garden in their yard and is looking for inspiration and, and or even just to learn more about rain gardens and, and their benefits. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we were able to kindly break ground on our two rain garden demonstration locations, uh, Campus View, which is right adjacent to the Bowker Creek Headwaters, which is right across the street there, as well as Monterey Middle School, which is just up from uh, McNeil Bay in Oak Bay. Um, uh, both of these schools, you know, we were able to work with the school district um, and do some education and outreach with students throughout the year, do some planning of the rain gardens, do some education. And finally, this summer, we were able to come in and actually build the things. Next slide, please. So this is the campus view, a couple shots, and essentially just the play-by-play. -play. We removed some of that hard pack kind of uh, top soil and replaced it with some much more kind of loamy and uh, absorbent soil. Uh, there's, uh, is that Pete, Peter? Peter Stanchek uh, standing in the, the, there helping us out with some of the engineering side of things. Um, and yeah, so we removed all that soil, brought in some new topsoil. Next slide, please. And then the fun part, we had um, Mount Doug High School students pair up with Campus View Elementary students and do some contouring of the site. They did their own contouring, um, digging some channels and things throughout, um, doing some wonderful plantings. Uh, for the plants provided from satin flower nurseries. And I think, we, you know, we had <laughs> quite a few kids participating in this one. And it was a really fun amount of chaos that ensued, but um, we were all really impressed with how well they did with planting. Um, there's a couple of other sites, uh, gardens that we created, smaller ones up on the upper end of the parking lot um, that we're just waiting for the district to finish up with their drainage for, but we completely prepped the sites and because we planted this site quite densely, we'll be doing some transplanting into those two smaller gardens uh, in the springtime. Next slide, please. Monterey Middle School, this was a bit of an older uh, cohort of students involved um, and a really great one. We had a really great teacher, really great principal um, who came together and participated. And we had lots of great uh, information sessions with two different classes, or no, four different classes over, the, over two years um at, who were involved in the planning as well as the construction and, and planting so really great opportunities to bring the community and the students in around these projects basically built out what was a pretty underutilized space um building a berm around it bringing in that topsoil creating some nice contouring um next slide please and capturing water from that entire school parking lot that you can see up in the right there so all that water flows in it comes in and it you know it's very well sized for the parking lot, so it'll take a very large event for any overflow to occur. But um, yeah, and we had students come in and plant it. We had the community come out and, and do some exercises and design and, and also planting, having Kristen and Ms. Kelly there, as well as the school district uh, horticulturalist. And just having discussions about different plant selections and uses and areas uh, was really fun. We had students go out and, and kind of also do a similar exercise looking at the different microclimates for plants and how they might work as well so really hands-on learning opportunities provided by these um, a really fun day planting plants with all the students and as these kind of grow up and grow into themselves they are going to be uh yeah continue to be really wonderful functioning pieces of uh green stormwater infrastructure and i next slide that's it for me on to you ian thanks everyone Thanks, Kyle. Um, that was great. There's lots there and lots to uh, a lot to unpack. And uh, do you have any questions right now for Kyle? We have an answer in the um, in the chat. You want to unmute yourself or come with the questions later on. So I'm going to talk about a few things here. Um, uh, if we don't have any any. Um, any questions? 
So this is uh, the Shatlight Creek culvert repair. And there's a few things I'd like to just say, which I um, wanted to say that uh, Shatlight Creek is a creek that we've worked on for almost 20 years. And we did a lot of work in the early 2000s. And we worked with extensively with Deep Cove Elementary School students, uh, releasing fish. We didn't have a lot of uh, success in terms of returns. Um, uh, and then the, as a result of the November uh, 16th, uh, or sorry, November 2021 atmospheric rivers, um, this culvert uh, blew out and needed to be replaced. So you're seeing the, the new arch culvert that went in at Chalet Road. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what the road looked like, or actually where, where the road disappeared. It, um, it, 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 um, it took off. This is looking, I believe this is looking, um, this is looking north. Um, and that was the article in the Times Colonist. See the asphalt um, collapse down. Uh, the culvert plugged up and then the, um, uh, the road over top, and then the whole thing let go and uh, washed downstream, causing significant damage to fish habitat as well as to the road. So uh, the District of North Saanich was uh, really Johnny on the spot. Ben Martin, the um, engineer, applied for uh, emergency funding right away and secured about $650,000 to fix this. But he fi the idea was to fix it in such a way that it would be good for fish and would never plug again. Next slide, please. Okay, and you can see on the left, there's another uh, picture of the of the collapsed uh, uh, road. Um, quite dangerous. It was lucky that uh, no one was actually driving over it. Somebody drove over it about uh, oh, about 30 seconds before it went. So um, that was quite quite something. Um, if you look on the right, that's at downstream at a bridge, and that's the debris that was caused. Uh, that's about uh, six feet deep, and that was the debris that got pushed over uh, when the wall of water went downstream. So Chalet Road's about 250 meters upstream of the ocean. And at Tidewater, there's been a problem with fish access uh, because of some bedrock. So um, what Ben did is he not only got the arch culvert as part of the project, but also um, the fish habitat immediately downstream and uh, was to be funded out of this project. And then they went a little bit further and said, well, let's do some work downstream of that. So they ended up putting in another $35,000 in uh, work downstream of this bridge, you can see in the right hand photo, in order to improve fish habitat there, but to actually improve access. What was very interesting in this project, um, I was very surprised, pleasantly surprised, that we found about 30 coho juveniles that had somehow survived either the their, they or their parents had survived um, the, 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 the uh, washout and had survived to, to when we caught them, as well as cutthroat trout. So obviously fish were getting up past the barrier, but um, they'll be able to do it a lot better now. Next slide, please. So um, you can see there, this is the um, uh, 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 part of the, uh, the work in order to isolate the site. Uh, if you look at the far right, there was a, there was a plate that was put in um, into the stream to block the stream because it was still raining in, um, in, in June and July, if you remember when you're trying to do this. So we had to block the site and pump around. And it was started early so that we could make sure that we got it all done. Uh, before the fall, and it did take, um, started about the third week of June, and um, it didn't uh, finish, we didn't finish planting until November, but um, they were basically um, out of the stream by September. Uh, next slide, please. And again, another uh, uh, way, so the, uh, the, the bottom was prepped with this large rock, and then the culvert um, was assembled within the um, within the cut in the road. Next slide. And we we uh, ended up putting in uh, a fish habitat both uh, uh, downstream. Um, this is uh, if you look um, 
the right's just downstream of the bridge, as well as uh, quite a bit further downstream. You can see um, uh, one of the workers from the uh, contractors using a hose to to um, seal um, uh, the the side with the sides with um, sand into the gravel rip rock rip route. Um, next slide, please. So um, a lot of fish habitat was uh, created. Um, the barrier at the mouth, I had a little video, but it didn't work. The barrier at the mouth was chipped out with a excavator that um, about four days to chip, 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 and little bits by little bits. Um, but now it's much more accessible for fish. So we expect fish coming back. And much like we did at Boker Creek, we're gonna be putting in incubators into uh, Chalet Creek in order to uh, incubate fish um, right in the uh, area. And the upstream neighbor um, who hadn't really engaged with us back in the 2000s um, is engaging with us now. And he owns the property all the way from Chalet Road to West Saanich Road. So he came down quite a few times uh, during the project and wants us to go and work on his property. So it's kind of revitalized the whole Chalet project um, um, all over again. So you can see this is the planting party we had in November, very successful. So thank you to uh, to Ben Martin and North Santos for having some um, vision and doing the right thing and stepping up and going above and beyond. And as well to the volunteers and the contractors that worked on it, Calvin Van Buskirk from Terratech, who was the expert in those arch culverts, as well as uh, Northridge Excavating and um, um, swell environmental were, were involved as well. And uh, I think next slide. And I think that I just wanna also to uh, introduce Sue Gillette. Um, she's, uh, um, she's there, and if you wave uh, Sue, she's, she's um, uh, taken over from Francesca um, in September. So we had some great overlap period between the two of them. And uh, so Sue is the one, if you uh, call or leave a message, she has peninsula streams at gmail.com. And she's the point person doing the administration and contact for the organization. So thank you and welcome Sue to the, to the, uh, uh, the team and the organization. Um, so here's a few stats that we've been up to um, uh, this year for 2022. Um, so we've had 25 work parties uh, in various creeks. Uh, and beaches, um, stewardship groups will be supporting and or starting. Um, so working with uh, lots of you folks out there. Um, and uh, that we didn't mention, but, uh, um, and then we've applied for 45 grants. So we've been pretty busy, next slide please. And volunteer hours, uh, not quite as many as last year and not quite as many on the beach program. Um, but uh, we've got a lot more on rain gardens. And the reason we didn't get as many hours in is we haven't had beach cleanups. And when you've got 40 or 50 people on a beach cleanup and they put two or three hours in, that adds up quite quickly. We are, as um, uh, Austin said, we're looking for beaches to clean up and other restoration ideas and activities. So please uh, get a hold of us. Uh, you know, if you, if you just get peninsula streams at gmail.com. Go to our website, uh, look at our other um, activities, other things we've got on our website, of webinars on a lot of our projects, including all quits, et cetera, et cetera. And um, um, uh, yeah, so uh, that's it for us uh, for right now. And uh, yeah, there's the stat. So pretty close to um, uh, uh, last year and um, so we're, 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 we're getting up there about 4,000 hours a year. Next slide, please. And that's it, a picture of the staff. We had a little staff swim and barbecue at uh, 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 Carmel Thompson of the Friends of Maltby Lake and her property up at Maltby Lake. And it was a fun time. And there's myself and Tamara, Kyle, Austin, um, Shelly, um, Katrina and Francesca. So anyway, that's great. Thank you uh, for attending tonight and uh, we're ready to take questions. I just wanna say one more thing. We wouldn't 
be able to do what we do without our all of our partners. One of them in, in particular, I don't think we've said their name enough tonight, Specific Salmon Foundation. So they uh, have been, a, uh, they're, they're solid. They have our uh, front and our back on a lot of these uh, restoration projects. So again, thanks to the Salmon Foundation, as well as the rest of you. So, um, and the volunteers and the board. So all of you are all part of this. We couldn't do all this great stuff. Um, so I will uh, uh, say, we'll take it over to questions. Don't, don't everybody speak at once. Um, yeah, thanks, Grant, and, and thanks, Sean. Um, the plans for 2023, John, um, include, uh, well, as we said, those funding applications we've got in for um, uh, BC Shrift and the Air, um, as well as ones we'll put in with the Salmon Foundation and our steady, you know, regular ones like call quits. Um, but there's some pretty big things will be happening in View Royal, John. Uh, we also have lots of plans for um, Millstream and, um, and other places. Thanks, Kitty, and thank you for your help, Kitty, um, with uh, the, the um, microscope work on forage fish. Great. And um, yeah, and as John says, lots of excitement along Millstream. That's great. Um, we're going to out, be out to helping um, the uh, Millstream group. I would like to say if there's anybody from Langford out, out there that the spillway repair job, we just had to do it because not so much that the fishway was um, uh, going to be impaired, but it would have been impaired. But because it was starting to collapse, um, we weren't sure if we had another atmospheric river, what would happen and how much more it would go. So we decided that whatever the cost, we had to go in. We had about $9,700 to do that repair job. The bills come in at 100,000. So we are actively looking for money. Uh, we've got some funding partners, but we are we're short. So we will be going around. I don't know whether CRD might be um, available to do it, John. Maybe we could talk about that. Um, but also uh, perhaps we'll be uh, approaching the new council Langford to see if we can get some support. We just had to do it. That's, you know, again, because um, um, we don't know what would have happened if, if it hadn't been, damage had me fixed. Great. Um, and some other things in the chat. So uh, I think there was 46 participants. Um, um, what did ever store through zoning of whole ships? Bill, no. <laughs> um, there is no, not really any coordination um, uh, to restore through zoning or SCP the whole stream systems. Um, not on a stream basis. I mean, there is some things with respect to OCPs. Um, and on the peninsula, there's been a group called the, the um, uh, Saanich Peninsula uh, uh, Environmental Coalition, which has been working with the three municipalities on the peninsula to coordinate within their OCPs to look at um, uh, connectivity of ecosystems crossing municipal boundaries. So that would be um, um, uh, uh, where streams and that would, would be going. Uh, the CRD isn't doing that, although they, although they are helping out on some things. Uh, Shrift is the Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund, and it's a uh, the new round is just being announced. It's um, uh, 147 million, 47 million from the province, and 100 million from DFO. Um, yeah, I guess if we do get our Shrift um, and uh, Airf and or Airf, um, we'll get a large in kind support from CRD. Uh, through that, so that's great. Um, so again, it's uh, we 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 do get support from some of the staff at CRD, but their mission isn't necessarily what we um, what you would say, Bill, as uh, being uh, coordinated working uh, across watersheds. 
I just like to say, I didn't say also to, uh, I was going to throw a couple slides in, but I never got around to it. And that is we had a volunteer, the last volunteer event we had was just a few days ago at uh, Roberts Bay. It was a, uh, a boat that was sunk there and uh, some debris got on the beach. So Seca Marine uh, and friends of our residents of Robert Bay went out and did some um, uh, debris cleanup, which was which was great uh, to get out the beach. Fortunately, there wasn't significant uh, um, uh, uh, petroleum release from that from that, that uh, spill, and the wreck is now being removed. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see what else. Have I forgotten anything? Keep the questions coming, the comments coming in. It's good. I'm sure councillors, oh, okay, John, I should councillors come together on climate action environment issues. Yeah, um, you know, uh, if there's an ad hoc group, John, of that, um, you know, we can address um, some of the, what we expect to see as far as climate change is concerned. Um, I imagine the next um, uh, staff report we'll have will likely be in April. Um, and that will be kind of, uh, at that point in time, will be, uh, it'll be a shorter one, not, not so much with what we've done over the winter, but more um, what we plan to do into the, into the summer period. And we should have, a, uh, have uh, by the end of April, we will have our funding um, requests will all be either uh, denied or funded. So we'll know a pretty good idea of what we're doing, but we're planning for those eventualities and uh, we're going to use that little bit of hiring right now. Um, yeah. Um, good. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you for what you do. And I hope we get a lot of memberships from tonight's uh, um, 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 session. So that that would that would be that would be good. Yeah. And there you go. Become a member. That's. Good. It's in the chat. If you haven't seen it in the chat, Jocelyn's just put in a, um, a reminder of, of what uh, of, of sort of a link to become a, a member. So it's only uh, uh, I think. If, so Dora said, uh, if I buy memberships for friends and family, you said anything to let them know. Yes, I, I, Jocelyn, would you like to answer that? Membership chair. Just unmuting. Um, it when it, when you put in, you, you need to um, put in their names and uh, emails uh, when you when you um, purchase their their uh, their memberships, and we will send um, we send an, a, a thank you and acknowledgement to to those to those people and emails for sure. And then once they're members, they're probably, uh, hopefully they want the newsletter and they get all kinds of information and, and invitations to great sessions like this. So lots of benefits all around. And it's only 10 bucks and it takes two minutes to do it, so. Great, thanks Jocelyn. And I should have mentioned, and I don't know if I did at the, at the time, but uh, we will have a link to this. If there's people that you, um, that didn't make it, weren't able to attend tonight. We will have a link, it'll, it'll be published on the website. And I think that we have a, um, a door prize, did we not, um, Sue? We have a winner for the door prize. Maybe not. Yep, we do. Um, John Rogers. John Rogers, well. Uh, John Rogers is one of 25 uh, randomly selected, um, won a $25 gift certificate to, uh, or gift card to uh, Mount Equipment Co-op. So, yay. And, and ironically, um, when John was asking about, uh, talking about the CRD and everything else, getting involved, um, it was the CRD that gave us that gift card as part of um, uh, thank you for our volunteers doing work in CRD parks. So it it goes, you know, it goes around again. So it comes back to John. That's great. I hope that um, um, uh, you'll be able to uh, utilize that. You can buy a, something for your kayak or something. I don't know, some sunglasses. 
Ian, I think we've got a question from Grant. Uh, Grant, hand up. Sure. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to know if we have to make a formal request to get the data from the um, North Saanich monitoring Ian to get back into Ray Creek. I think we came up on that before. I just wanted to kind of remind you, if we can get the all clear to go back in there, there's quite a few places we could uh, get the anglers and a few other people involved to do some work in there. But I know it's until we get an all clear on the contamination. So we need those results. I'm just not sure who we have to go through. I just thought I'd ask you, so. Um, yeah, no, um, that's a really good point, Grant. Um, we, we were talking about the staff meeting today. We're gonna make a, a, a pitch to Freshwater Fisheries BC for a grant this year. We're either gonna be partnering with Central Saanich on a, a project in um, uh, on Tateat at the Artifact Society or Ray Creek. So we're looking potentially at Ray Creek. It depends on who comes to the table first, whether Sydney and North Saanich. It very, um, North Saanich looks like they're gonna be building a bridge just above the highway to connect um, the um, uh, subdivision at Eagle first to uh, uh, Peter Grant Park to the, to the um, north. So if they do that, um, that might be a good opportunity to get in there and do some work. So, um, and we can, uh, it's, a, it's as good a cutthroat as it is a go. It's probably a better cutthroat stream than it is a go stream. Um, so we may be, that, that might be the impetus. We do need to find out about the contamination. Um, if Grant, if you send me an email um, and asking that question on behalf of the Sydney anglers, um, or just as a citizen, I will use that to send on to the Airport Authority and Transport Canada to try to shake shake out that uh, results of the contamination studies downstream of the pond. So that's kind of what we need to do. And then once we've got that, then we can go to our friends at uh, Sydney Council as well as North Saanich and say, you know, we're going to bring money in. We want to do this project, and we want to work with the community on it. So. Um, uh, let's do it. I would suggest that we probably will uh, hire Dave Clough to do a, a, a restoration, an assessment and restoration um, um, uh, plan for the creek right from the ocean up to um, probably right up into the airport. That's, that's great, Ian. Thanks. That's good news. I want to take that back to the anglers because there was some opportunity with coho this year a lot more than we'd seen. And I don't know if you heard the results from Mill Bay, but we broke another record over there at Seanigan with over 4,000 adults moved again. So those three cycles are very strong and there's a lot of stray coho around, which is great news for the area chalet too. So thanks, yeah. Ian. Thanks, thanks, Grant. Ian, it's um, uh, Mick here. Uh, I just want to recognize uh, Sue Pollard and Freshwater Fisheries Society of BC on the cutthroat um, end of things, because they've provided small amounts of money for the last uh, three or four years now. And they're not huge amounts of money, but certainly the profile, I think, of cutthroat in the overall systems here has really come up. And I think there's really good potential um, to keep on working along those lines as well as with coho and chum so yep. uh let's hear it for the cutthroat and yeah and I, I, fssbc I, which comes yeah. from fishing licenses right so that's good i'm glad you brought that up mick i gave a tour to sue pollard and some people from uh, the, um uh, fisheries uh fish 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 habitat protection program of dfo but specifically to um some ecosystem biologists from the province and give them a tour of, of Millstream, Colquitts, Craig Flower, Hagen, and Tatea Creek. It took them to Cutthroat, where we're working on Cutthroat, where um, uh, uh, our crew was doing the sampling. Um, and the biologist, uh, um, uh, Brendan Anderson, who's a senior ecosystem biologist, who's got the, who's um, took, took the samples for DNA. They're very interested in it. They gave us a great letter of support for our BC Shrift. We're gonna be incorporating cutthroat into our um, into our programs, whether it's, uh, we're gonna be doing some tagging, 
So if we're going to do pit tagging for coho, we might as well do pit tagging for cutthroat. And uh, we're probably going to be operating the Millstream camera uh, with the Goldstream volunteers uh, through the winter, or at least in the cut cutthroat spawning uh, time. And we may be talking to Dorothy about um, doing that as well um, mm -hmm. uh, on Colquitt's camera so that we can start feeding back data to the province about cutthroat populations, migration patterns, et cetera, because they're actually quite blown away by what we've come up with just in the last couple of years in terms of uh, cutthroat distribution and um, uh, populations. That's without doing any real populations, but just, you know, uh, doing it. So they're really pleased. I've never seen the cooperation between uh, DFO and the province be as high as it is now. And I think a largely it has to do with that, them being forced to work together on that BC strip uh, funding program. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, team. Um, uh, Kitty Lloyd, though, that camera at Todd Creek was not put in this year. Um, it got wiped out in the, um, um, in the flood, and we just didn't have it in the budget for this year, but we'll be uh, looking at it to put it in uh, next year's budget. Um, there was, uh, do, 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 was there, did I miss any questions? Um, John's asking about permission from the Navy to work in Esquimalt Harbor. Um, I, we could use with, use some help with that. Um, um, we thought they were going to be more cooperative. I, I would think that, um, as our relationship with the Esquimalt First Station develops over time, that um, they'll have more leverage with DND than we will. Um, um, DND is quite, you know, protective of their areas. There is some beaches I'd love to get onto, but again, it's um, security and access, et cetera. It can be done, but I think that takes a while to build that trust in those relationships. And we're working with the Squimo, uh consulting with them prior to the Shrift application because we're going to partner with them on quite a bit um that sounded encouraging like that they wanted to do some beach restoration in their territory in Esquimalt Harbor and they have a, a pretty strong direct line to D&D &D. um as well as I believe their jurisdiction ends at Coal Island so anything towards Millstream from Coal Island is potentially fair game I believe um as far as doing marsh restoration stuff so there's also that that piece of it There's quite a, I just want to say there's quite a bit within the, the Shrift and the Earth um, uh, applications in View Royal, both in Portage Inlet and the Squam Alarm. Okay, well, it's 8.24. I had some, um, this is good. People have hung on. We still got 34 people here, which is awesome. Um, usually people bail out, but that's, uh, that's okay. I'm, I'm quite pleased that, uh, um, people have stayed around for the question period. Um, anything else uh, that uh, anybody's got? I'd just like to say too that uh, we have other partners within. Uh, Kyle, if you want to just talk about, uh, Kyle and Katrina talked about some of the other partners that, that would be involved with the uh, BC Shrift application. Yeah, for sure. The, both Shrift and AIR will involve a very extensive uh, group of partners. So all the different municipalities that we'll be working in, so View Royal, um, the Saanich, uh, um, as well as Langford and Colwood for Millstream, uh, working closely with CRD, uh, also other NGOs, so World Fisheries Trust as well, and then First Nations uh, will be a big another big partner. Uh, Esquimalt Nation, as well as Songhees Nation, um, and then some other partners as well that will be more involved with Kyle's uh, um, shoreline and marsh restoration, if you want to mention those ones, Kyle. Yeah, the um, well, the City of Victoria as well. I uh, Pacific Salmon Foundation is a really big partner uh, as they develop a lot of their marine science tools, as well as uh, the BC Conservation Foundation in their bottlenecks program. Both of those will be uh, linked quite closely with our application. Uh, the CRD, as Ian mentioned, uh, providing a lot of in-kind, will be working and 
kind of within and in synergy with some of their programs like water quality monitoring, as well as some of the water quantity stuff they, they hope to achieve. Um, the province, again, as Ian mentioned, on the fishery side of things, as they develop their coastal cutthroat conservation strategy, um, will be tied in quite closely with that if they're successful for their ask to develop that, um, as well as water quantity uh, issues and hydrology. Um, yeah, that's all I think of off the top of my head. I would say that, um, um, yeah, it, 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 um, also too, I don't want to leave Dorothy out, but Salmon in the City, we'd probably like to put an array in with her fence or somewhere near that and uh, talk to her about being part of the cutthroat um, the, uh, bit. Uh, Bill Irving said uh, uh, the rehabbing of Esquimalt Harbor and um, uh, they may have funds for tidal areas rehab. That's right, Bill, you're exactly right. And um, they've been in contact with us over the last couple of years about us helping them find um, projects. Um, so we've been actively involved with uh, Public Works Canada um, on that. They've been a little bit quiet lately, so it's about time I, I gave them a, a shout and see whether they're going to, you know, shake some... Uh, some uh, funding dollars and they would they would just take on like we would just say okay well here here here's the idea here's the plan um and they would they would they would run run at it with their money and their consultants so it's got to be something that stands alone uh they, they would go for um yeah a question from john um the crd release water from this lake for returning salmon on crud flour no not that I know of. It's not it's not controlled um, in that sense. It's not controlled from salmon. I believe that the um, um, uh, that this year the water because of the drought, the water was so low that there was no there wasn't really any any water coming out of Prior Lake um, into uh, into the uh, Craig's Wire for a long time after the rain started. So uh, I don't know if there's actually actively uh, retention for that. And I don't think it's being managed for fish. That's one of the things we'd be looking at and particularly utilizing um, people like um, um, uh, uh, the Coastal Collaborative um, um, Sciences from World Fisheries Trust, as well as Climal Anglers and Bruce Bevan. So um, yeah. Good one, John. Yep. All right. Well, it's eight twenty-nine. Thanks. This is great. Um, uh, I I think this has been an awesome session. It's gone till eight thirty. We pride ourselves in, if not starting on time, ending on time. So uh, we don't want to take anybody's to drag it on. So contact us if you got any. If you got more questions, um, there will be a link sent out to everybody that was. That was uh, here tonight. I think we can do that. Um, um, and Sue will send it out so you can share that link. I think we're going to post the link on our website as well. Um, uh, yeah, um, that's right. Uh, good, good point, uh, Kyle. Um, uh, Mick has been pushing the CRD on uh, quantity, quality, fish-friendly flow issues, flow issues. And that is a that is a big beast in itself, uh, Mick. You know, and uh, um, so I would say again, John Rogers might be a really good uh, uh -huh. uh, liaison on a political level for that, and try to get things um, um, uh, going. Uh, thanks, thanks, Ian. John. I'll be in, I'll be in touch with uh, I'll be in touch with John. There's been a lot of background work, and it's uh, it's a difficult area to make progress in, but. I'll I'll give you a, a call, John. Uh, we've got lots of reports, and we've had several meetings with uh, CRD, and there are some constraints uh, which we can talk about. All right, everybody. That I think that's it. Thanks for that. Uh, um, um, uh, that and thanks, John, for for everything. And thanks, everybody. Thanks, staff. You're awesome, and thank you, board and members and that Sandra volunteer of the year in 2022.
I don't know if you might be in 2023 again, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> you, but you never know. Anyway, thanks, everybody. All Good right. night, everyone. Thank Good night. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you all.